Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan, Roth the Motor City Madmouth here, wishing everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday Season. And I am pleased to be joined by Ron Renzi. Good evening, Ron. Good evening, Scott. Pleasure to be here, as always. And Ken Breslauer, long time no see, just a few weeks ago, right, Ken? That's right. Good to see you again. Yeah, it really is. So, uh, hey, what better time to talk motorsports here during football season to let people know that, hey, motorsports is uh, a beautiful sport. And I got to tell you that I know that there were always four or five major sports, but I always put the obviously football, baseball, and hockey, and auto racing has become my fourth, and the NBA, or AKA the NDL, the National Drama League, may, may make it to the fifth or the sixth. And I don't really care about the NBA, so when auto racing cracks my fourth, then you can tell you that I love anything connected with motorsports. I've really had a lot of fun working with you, and I know we have a lot of things ahead. So That's good to hear you. I mean, you're in a, a good spot. You know, we've got so much great racing in Florida, especially. Uh, you got NASCAR and IndyCar and sports cars and so forth. So uh, it's, uh, it's a, a big sports uh, segment here in the state. Sure. Well, I got to tell you, uh, earlier this month, um, for my dad's 80th birthday, my dad took my wife and I over to this place called the M1 Concourse, which is located in Pontiac, Michigan. They call it the Champion Motorsports Speedway. I was talking to my nephew, Brandon, about it, and him and his younger brother, Brock, liked to go ahead and race around that track a little bit. And I found it to be a very interesting place because it's like, you know, lots of big heavy hitters are actually sponsoring a garage. And some of them are two level one. They store cars at times on the bottom uh, if you have a two level. And then they have a nice setup where everybody gets to hang out. And I was telling them, you know, Brandon, one of these days, I'm going to have to drag you up to Sebring. And I intend to do that because this place is just unbelievable. And when I look at uh, some of the tracks that I've been through over the years, you know, some of the ones I've enjoyed the most are the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I've seen a couple Indy 500s and a Brickyard 400 for that matter. And I don't know if you're familiar with Indianapolis Raceway Park. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's a great place. Michigan Inter International Speedway, which I call my home track, obviously, in the Irish Hills. Phoenix International Raceway, Bristol Motor Speedway, Belle Isle when they were doing the Detroit Grand Prix. I'm sure you're familiar with that being a road course guy. Martinsville, I, I ended up taking some laps around there on my own. I, I didn't break the 11th commandment and didn't get caught. So it was pretty nice to take 27 laps at about 55, 60 miles an hour. Don't tell on me, crap, crap, okay? Otherwise, they'll nail me for trespassing, but they'll never know what year I did it anyways. But I didn't <laughs> cause any problems. But Charlotte Motor Speedway, I actually took a ride along and paid for that one. Daytona International Speedway, love going to the place. And I ended up going to Darlington, but it was only like a 10 or 15 minute stop on my way home off of I-95 was there. And I can tell you, some of the things on my bucket list, and we talk about bucket list, okay, is I would love to get to Talladega, uh, Kelsey's track out in Atlanta. What is it? Uh, what's Road it? Atlanta. Road Atlanta. Okay. Uh, and, of course, Las Vegas Motor Speedway, California and Texas, just to name a few. So, you know, I'm a racing junkie. And I, a lot of these days I would really love to take some laps with my vehicle around your course here if I could ever work out the insurance that we could ever make it happen. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure we can figure out how that can happen. Yeah, awesome. I don't know. I mean, the Motor City Man Mouth loving to drive. Come on. Mm -hmm. hey, you know what? We'll do something together. I, I told you, I love promoting your track, and we're going to have a whale of a time. So, you know, but the I found that the M1 concourse in Pontiac was interesting. And the reason why I bring it up is when I went there, I was, my dad and I and my wife were driving around, and I saw Sebring. Uh, having sponsoring one of those garages, I told my dad, "Look at this, Sebring is sponsor one of these things." And you know what? That's one of my favorite tracks. I love going to the place. And all of a sudden, Sebring makes its way to the Motor City at this very concourse, and yeah, it caught his attention a little bit. Not that he knew much about it; he just goes there to hang out anyhow. And my nephew Brandon is more into auto racing. My brother Lonnie. Um, ended up investing in, I believe it's part of a business expense that he can wine and dine people because he said he owns a uh, chain called the Black Rock Bar and Grill, which is, while they have franchises, 
a lot of their major business in the Metro Mall in Detroit area. So it's a good way to wine and dine clients. So I'm sure you probably have many things over at Sebring where you probably find it conducive to gatherings, don't you? Where people, places to promote each other, don't they? Yeah, I mean, obviously Sebring is a smaller market. I mean, we're fortunate in that we have our own hotel at the track, which is pretty unusual. Most, most uh, motorsports facilities don't have that. So we're fortunate to have that. But, you know, the Sebring name is known around the world. And I'm, I'm glad it's represented in Pontiac, Michigan. It's kind of interesting because when you talk to Europeans, Sebring is a magic name to them. It's probably better known in Europe than it is in North America. Uh, but uh, we're one of the oldest and probably have one of the most interesting histories of any circuit in North America. Yeah, well, when you get represented in the Motor City, everybody knows how much how big racing was. And I, I really missed it when the open wheel race no longer continued at MIS, because I used to go there for that race. And then they one time had a race called the US 500 when oh, yeah. Hart and Indy broke up, and I ended up going to the US 500. So that was – anytime I could go to the Irish Hills, it was really always a treat to go there. Uh, you know, you can't ask for a much more beautiful setting, at least up in the Midwest. We, I mean, we can't consider Indianapolis a beautiful setting. It's just plain old history. And, and again, I, what I noticed about yours being such a international event was when I w went there as a rookie, okay, back in 19, and I saw all those European writers. My goodness, I said, holy moly. Maybe I wish I would have taken other languages, and I never was a foreign language guy in the first place. Well, Indy, Indianapolis is the center of the racing world, to me anyway. It's just got such a great history. It's such a great event. Uh, it, was, it was great to see Roger Penske by the track, and I'm sure bigger and better things are ahead for Indianapolis. Well, now I know that, if I remember right, Roger Penske was at our last race, wasn't he? Right. The, the 500 got postponed from May to September, and uh, that was Penske's first event. Unfortunately for him, it was a non-spectator race. Uh, because of the COVID situation. Uh, but he, he has already spent millions of dollars in improvements at Indianapolis. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, that event is just so, as you know, is so big when you have 250,000 people uh, okay. in one place. It's, it's amazing spectacle. It really is. Has Roger Penske spent much time over at your track at all? Yeah, uh, he's, he's, he comes almost every March. Um, his team does a lot of testing at Sebring and always has. Uh, the, the test course is the uh, Green Park part of the track where the IndyCar teams test. And uh, Penske Racing is used Sebring for years and years as an important testing facility. Of course, they've been running the Acura team the past three years, so they've also been testing their uh, prototype Acura. Uh, he's not with Acura anymore effective next year. But the rumor is, is that he's going to be the official Porsche factory team uh, when they introduce their new prototype in 2023. So oh, Penske's got a, a long legacy. I mean, he drove at Sebring going back to, I think, 1962. Wow. So uh, he's driven at Sebring and he's won at, at Sebring three times as a car owner. Now, the... Turn that you're talking about the hotel. Is that turn seven over at the hotel? Is that correct? right? Hence the, the name of the hotel is seven, uh, which is the, the turn that it overlooks. Uh, we call it the hairpin. It's the same as turn seven. Uh, and it's a spectacular view of the track. Yeah, Ron and I have a guy in our chamber named Mike Del Pozo who plans right. to do a mini event, nothing like the sanction that you're doing. But you and I talked about it when I was over there. Uh, a few months ago, uh, about uh, earlier this month, and it was pretty neat when you think about it, because, you know, he, he said to me, you know, because he, he follows Sebring, and then again, a lot of people in South Florida do, and worldwide, but he noticed that quickly when I went out there and said, you know what, we're having 10 on the line, and I took a picture of your book, by the way, and put it on Facebook, let me tell you, some of the reaction that we're getting on social media with that book, but it struck a chord with Mike anyhow, and you know, but, you know, it's like anything else. When you understand the history of auto racing, it goes deeper than just oval tracks. you got road courses all over the place. So, so. Well, the interesting thing about Sebring, too, is that a lot of people don't realize that 
uh, while we're known for the 12 hour event in March, the track is used almost every day of the year. A lot of club events, driving schools, corporate events, but the, probably the biggest use is testing, private testing by teams like Penske and Ganassi and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's pretty active over there all the time. Of course, the testing usually isn't open to the public, but uh, Sebring is a, a very, very active place all year. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible. I mean, Ron, you wanna, anything you want to add, Ron? No, I just think it, it's a beautiful facility. And I, yeah, I didn't realize until I, you know, Scott and I were talking that it was used like 300 days out of the year, which I, which I think is amazing. And that I was asked about that beautiful hotel. Is it, how far in advance is that booked for the 12 hours? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty hard to get a room there during the 12 hours. Uh, it's got 122 rooms. And uh, I would say probably it's probably 90% booked for the next few years. There's always a couple of wow. rooms that become open because people change their plans and so forth. Uh, it's not cheap either, obviously. Um, but it's, it's a great facility, and we're just so lucky that, that we have that. Um, it, it was built uh, when Don Pano's on the track uh, in mm -hmm. 2000. And um, it, it's one of the, the many draws. You know, Sebring doesn't have a lot of hotel rooms to begin with, in the, in the entire county, as a matter of fact. So it's, it's nice to have our own hotel. Absolutely. What would you say the average room costs there <laughs> for that event? I, I, you know, there's half the hotel is trackside, which means you have a view of the track. So those rooms, I'm sure, were twice as much as the, uh, the other ones. But uh, I'm sure it's uh, uh, at least two or three thousand dollars, and and you know, for a three day event. So it's 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 not cheap. Okay. Well, on an average, um, uh, you know, and not including you know COVID, but pre-COVID, what? How many fans would att averagely attend on the twelve-hour race? Well, the you know NASCAR when we got acquired by NASCAR in twenty twelve, uh, they ended public uh, announcements of figures. They don't allow that at any of the. Oh. Okay. So, and I don't even know. Uh, I mean, if you've been there, it's pretty obvious that there's a lot of people there. Uh, you know, promoters also have these grandiose figures that they release, um, and we're not into that. Um, but it's 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 probably as many people at the track as the entire population of Highlands County. <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> That's a lot of people. <laughs> That's funny. All right, Ken, why don't we go ahead and recap the 20, 20 12 hours of C-Ring. You told me yes. during Which that. Which was a great race. Then you had, what, six Indy 500 winners? Did I hear you? Yeah, we had a great field. Um, of course, I guess we need to backtrack and say that uh, the race was scheduled for March as always and was postponed till November and uh, it ran November 14th uh, as the finale of the season for the uh, International Motorsports yep. Association. Uh, it was a great race. I think we had 41 lead changes among eight cars, which is an endurance racing. That's a, a really, really exciting race. Wow. And it was won by Mazda, their first ever uh, major endurance win in North America. Uh, they had won Le Mans back in 1992 uh, with their rotary engine prototype. But this is their uh, first uh, major win in North America in endurance racing. And uh, it was uh, quite, uh, quite a finish, as you saw. Um, they were running one, two, and their other car had some problems at the very end. So they ended up first and third. But um, great, great field. Um, one of the winning drivers was Ryan Hunter Ray, who lives in Fort Lauderdale and, of course, is a former Indy 500 winner. And um, in the GT class, um, Porsche won, uh, but Corvette had already clinched the season championship. Um, but it was uh, one of the best races of the year. In fact, uh, one of the sports car racing websites, Daily Sports Car, um, named it the race of the year, um, which is quite an honor when you consider, you know, Le Mans and uh, Nuremberg Ring and Spa and all these other endurance races are part of it. So uh, we, we were really, really happy with the race. It, it was very exciting. It was a really difficult race for the staff um, because of obviously it being postponed and 
the various uh, protocols because of the COVID situation, we had to limit attendance to 50% of normal capacity, right. um, which is very frustrating, not only for us, but for the fans. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's something that's probably going to happen in March. We're, we're kind of waiting to see on that, but uh, it was a great race, beautiful weather. Um, despite, if you remember, a tropical storm mm-hmm. threatening us earlier in the week. Uh, we had a plague in March and then a tropical storm in November, but we, we came through. We had a great race, um, and we're looking forward to March. Uh, we're not used to having to do this all over again in, in only three or four months, but uh, it's a short turnaround you know, for us. But um, we're looking forward to it. It's going to be a good event. Well, we know Corvette and Porsche are big players anyways, aren't they, Ken? Obviously, they, uh, one thing I'm amazed at, this racing, let alone – endurance racing is you better have these things built much better than normal because you're talking about like you alluded to again endurance racing is what you're talking about right and you hit the nail on the head that the two most popular manufacturers for fans is corvette and porsche they Mm -hmm. have the biggest following Uh, corvette has a fanatic following of fans as you've probably seen and porsche porsche does as well they've won the race 18 times and um you know, it's another interesting aspect of that is that over the years, the attrition rate at Sebring, it used to be half the cars never finished because of just the rough nature of the track and, you know, 12 hours of racing is, is really tough. It, it's now 90% of the cars finish the race. So it's, it's amazing how technology, reliability by these, you know, factory teams, that these cars are so well tested, right. they're so high tech. Uh, that they can survive Sebring, you know, relatively intact. And, you know, we all know Sebring is is a, just a really, really brutal track. It's extremely rough. It has that old concrete surface. Uh, and, um, you know, we run day and night, uh, hot and cold, uh, rain, you name it. Um, but the, the reliability of cars and endurance racing in today's world is amazing. Um, I, when I first started working at Sebring, going to Sebring, I mean, cars would be dropping out left and right all race. Um, and now, um, I mean, that's why even though it's a 12 hour race, uh, the, the drivers will tell you it's a sprint race. They drive like it's a two hour race because the reliability of the cars is just, um, they can thrash around, you know, all out for 12 hours. Well, when you talk about the appropriate sponsor for this race, Ron has it in his background, Mobile One. And by the way, I'm kind of like wearing it. Okay, we all know it's known for synthetic oil. You have got to have an incredible oil to be able to survive what these vehicles are expected to do, Ken. Yeah, that, you know, that's, that's one of the many elements of, uh, you know, racing and uh, uh, Mobile One synthetic oil. A lot of t- Porsche uses it and Corvette uses a Mobile One. Um, but, you know, even the tire technology, uh, Michelin has developed Michelin. tires that are just unbelievably reliable. Um, you see uh, teams doing uh, two, um, two, three, even four hours now without changing tires, which is amazing. You know, it, at the speeds they're going, the G-forces, you know, they're, they're encountering in a tough surface. Um, you know, the technology of the sport is just amazing. I mean, if, if you had a chance to walk around the, the pits and see the telemetry of the Corvette team, they have about 45 computer screens they have like 10 engineers um all these charts and graphs and it looks like uh space uh, control in houston i mean it's unbelievable Uh, it's uh and all the teams are pretty much at that level uh you know audi who's coming back to endurance racing in two years uh their setup is just incredible they actually have their computers Going back to Germany, the technicians in Germany are on the same computers watching all these telemetry, and they're in contact with the team in Sebring making decisions and monitoring all the aspects of the engine, the suspension. It's just, it's amazing, the technology. You know, I think I'm probably not only amazed at the technology, but I'm amazed at all the different types of manufacturers that constitute money. We talk about Mercedes is probably involved. 
imagine uh, you've got Rolls Royce. I mean, and all the names. We're not talking about Ford Pinos here or Fords. Not that I'm knocking Ford, but you know what I mean? I'm talking about money and the engineering around the world, which people don't realize that unless you've been to an event like this, that folks, there is a lot of money in the IMSA series floating around every single. I mean, I yeah. read all these transcripts that they send me, and I'm amazed at just how much money in, is involved, whether it's Michelin, Porsche, Corvette. You get to drill all over the place, and and that's what I think separates this from a lot of races. It's one thing, see, what I noticed, and I'm now going to be into my third rodeo with you in 21, but I've learned a lot every year covering the race, and you've certainly been a good teacher showing me a lot of the things beginning because it takes a little while to get used to covering a race like this when you're used to covering two or three hour events versus take that number of times by four or five and all of a sudden you're there a lot longer you know i mean well, yeah, and, and you know manufacturers um and our sport is very manufacturer driven but the manufacturers really do use endurance racing to improve their product i mean audi was a classic case of um using endurance racing to make improvements on their road cars and and every manufacturer does that and that's kind of the beauty of endurance racing is what we say it's relevant it's relevant to what you and i drive on the street right um it's mm -hmm. so there is a purpose to endurance racing and and there's also this great pride in winning races like uh, sebring and le mans um it means a lot to manufacturers uh it's it's really a uh a big deal. I mean, when Mazda won Sebring this year, I mean, they were just ecstatic. I mean, they started using it in all our advertising, and it's a big deal. It really is. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's really a big deal when you got top manufacturers, you know, Acura, Mazda, Cadillac, you know, and Corvette and Porsche and the rest of them. They all really want to show big at a at a race like Sebring because it's it improves their road cars and it's a really good advertisement because you see it in all the car magazines and and everything and and it's a great race i mean sports car 365 put it as their race of the year also i mean it's a big deal um winning sebring and it's not easy and i guess if because while well, we're going to talk about ken's book but it, it just can't has come such a long way since the since the track has opened hasn't it just the, it really just the way the races are run absolutely it's, it's it's so much more professional now i mean even back in the 80s and even the early 90s there was a portion of the field that was what we call weekend warriors you know guys that are kind of amateur um who would run in the race but now every team from top to bottom is just totally professional the the drivers are just top-notch drivers and uh i mean you you walk through the paddock and you see the the rigs the set up uh the transporters uh it it's a uh it's a serious deal now and um it, it really is a uh a way for manufacturers as they say to improve the breed and uh that's why you know in nascar uh fans tend to follow drivers they're, they're a fan of jimmy johnson or dale Earnhardt jr or whoever in endurance racing they're fans of manufacturers they'll go root for Corvette or Porsche or Lamborghini or whatever, BMW, whoever. And so it's, it's a different mentality. The, the fans of endurance racing are really devoted to the car they drive or the car they aspire to own. Um, so it's, a, it's really a different mentality. Yeah, it really is. I think so when, when you're covering this event as a member of the media, and I, and I have covered a lot of races over the years, what I found that I really – the bit to me the biggest transition here can is you can't it's hard for me to look at everything for 12 hours non-stop about who's winning and who's losing because you know obviously that's a long time and you have a lot of drivers going simultaneously so if anybody's looking to go ahead and see their neck get aching for 12 hours good luck you better have a good chiropractor or a therapist <laughs> because that isn't gonna happen here you're there as a writer or a member of the media, it's an endurance race for us to make sure that we can keep our attention, but it's so easy because you provide us with enough updates to do it. But from my first time there and that tent that you had, and then you put us up in that press box setting the second time, you know, you see it so much differently, you know, depending on where we're going to get put every year, you know. And so if anybody's looking to go to this race, don't treat it like a regular standard race here 
where you're in and out two or three hours. You better be thick skin mentally here to be able to endure 12 hours, let alone all the stuff early, the practices, the qualifying, everything that goes with it. Yeah, it's uh, absolutely true. I'm sure Herb Branham has told you uh, he's a veteran of many Sebring races, and uh, for journalists, it's a, it's an endurance race too. It, it's a, it's a hard thing to to cover um, when you have a 12-hour event and it ends, uh, you know, pretty late at night. Uh, a lot of people are on deadline and so forth. So it's a challenge. It's a tough tough event. But imagine the 24 hours of months covering that. I mean, do you sleep or not? I mean, it's it's a <laughs> Yeah, some 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 journalists stay the, the whole the whole time. It's uh, it's a it's a tough thing to cover for sure. Well, whether I get an opportunity at the Rolex Twenty Four, if I can't uh, get around there, I'll. I, my goal is at some point now that you brought it up, is to cover a twenty four hour race somewhere. It doesn't have to be Daytona somewhere. And I realized getting through 12 hours isn't easy. I need to challenge myself for another 12. And it'll probably take me a week to really recover. I'll be delirious, but it'll be a great delirious feeling. It'll be a great experience, though. This isn't like a woman having a baby going through labor. I mean, I realize I'm, I'm never going to experience that unless Bruce Jenner or Caitlyn Jenner. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry, I had to throw that out there. Well, imagine, though, I mean, you've got, you've got a little bit easy. Imagine all the uh, photographers who are out on the track yeah all kinds of weather um and you know we've had some years that are uh you know rain and cold and whatever so uh it, it's a challenge for photographers and it's a challenge for crews pit crews um you know they they don't have any opportunity to rest uh, they have to be ready at all times so it's it's a uh, it's tough on everybody the engineers the drivers the pit crews the journalists the fans uh, they can uh, do other things, uh, and as you know, they're they're known for partying at Sebring, so uh, <laughs> they uh, they keep themselves occupied. And for all those ladies listening to the broadcast, by no means am I ever trying to downplay the significance of you having a kid going through an endurance race nope. to come up with another. So I want to make sure I set the record straight. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, I'm not looking to offend anybody on this level, and I have to <laughs> set the record straight so nobody could find 10 different ways to give me hate mails or or emails. It's just an idea that endurance is whether it is whether you're whether you're in labor uh, with a kid or the labor of love covering motorsports for 12 hours, let alone graduating in 24. But I will get around to one of these days covering a 24-hour race. I don't care if Daytona or ever. I, I am going to do it, and I know Ken. If there's a connection that I can do it, I'm sure I would hope that you'll get. I'll get your uh, uh, help to try to pull it off, right? Okay. Somewhere. Yeah, we'll supply a plenty of coffee for you. How's that sound? Oh, that sounds good to me. Go. Find me a place that I can cover a 24-hour race, and I'm ready to do it. So, uh, but so, all right, let's talk about the fact that, Ken, you told me at Sebring that you went to 34 Indy 500s. My goodness, that's – anybody should be wow. thankful to have one on their bucket list. I've been fortunate enough to go to two. And to go to Indianapolis, I've done the practice stuff. I've done the qualifying but, and, and, and just being a part of an Indianapolis is great. One time, and I did it twice, but what about 34 of them? Well, I think, you know, it, like I said, it, to me, it's the center of the motorsports world. It, it is the greatest uh, motorsports event, but I always went as a spectator. You know, I sat in the grandstands, and I think when you do that, you really get the feeling of what that event is all about. And there is nothing more exciting than the Indianapolis 500, the pre-race, the build-up to the start and so forth. Um, it's an amazing race. The first few laps are just, I mean, there's nothing more exciting than that. Um, it's interesting because the, 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 the first time I went to Indianapolis, I think it was 1975, and I have to be honest with you, the city of Indianapolis itself was the biggest dump I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. Really? And by really? the... By the last time I went in the 2000s, downtown Indianapolis is one of the best downtowns in the United States. They totally turned Indianapolis uh, around. It is a fantastic city to visit. Now, the Speedway is outside of, you know, it's in Speedway, Indiana, outside right. west of downtown. But Indianapolis is a great city to go to. Awesome. Um, and they have just made so many improvements to the city, to the track. Uh, so many hotels, the convention center, you know, it, it, 
their sports facilities, you know, for football are unbelievable and basketball. Um, it, it's a really a great sports town. And the, the race is just unbelievable. If, if you want to be on a bucket list for, uh, for a sports event, even if you're not really a race fan, I recommend going to the Indianapolis 500 and sitting in the turn one grandstand, get the grandstand seat, and you'll be hooked. It's just, it's absolutely one of the most exciting events going. And you'll love Indianapolis. It's a great city. Yeah, I actually went to two, the two I went to. One, I sat in turn four where there was an accident on the very end, at the end of the race, where Al Unser Jr., I think you were at that race, ended up winning it. it was, I trying to remember who the driver was. It. Was it Castro Nevis, or I'm trying to remember. But anyways, Al Unser Jr. was the winner. Jacques Villeneuve finished second in that mm-hmm. race. And then the one I went to a year later, guess what? Jacques Villeneuve finished first. So this guy <laughs> participated in two Indy 500s, first one year, second, uh, first one year, you know, and obviously second another year. You can't have two better uh, race outcomes than with Jacques Villeneuve. You know what races I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. And, you know, um, I'm old enough to remember uh, Al, Al Unser Jr.'s father winning. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's how long I was I was going, but uh, yeah, the, I mean, there's been so many great races in Indianapolis. Um, you know, the finish Rick Mears and Gordon John Cock in 1982 was unbelievable, and uh, Al Junior passing Scott Goodyear at the end of the race. And I mean, there's there's been so many great uh, events. Uh, Fittipaldi when he uh, uh, wrecked with Al Junior, and Fittipaldi went on to win. I think it was '89, but. Uh, there's so many great moments in Indianapolis and, you know, despite the, you, you mentioned the, the cart IRL fight back in the nineties with the right. uh, U S 500 and all that. And, uh, despite all that, um, Indianapolis, you know, just, it's just an amazing event. It really is. Well, people got to understand that beyond the race, you had Jim Neighbors singing back home in Indiana. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you also <laughs> you have Mary, uh, uh, Holman, I think, gentlemen, or at that point, gentlemen and women start your engine. So that's part of it. But, you know, I, I can tell you this right now, Ken. I went, the two years I went, the Indiana Pacers were deep into the NBA playoffs. So if you think there was a lot going on at the track, how about the fact that you got downtown Indiana with the Pacers doing well, deep into the playoffs, then you have the race, and to make matters more interesting, when we talk about Indianapolis, I ended up doing an Indianapolis Raceway Park dirt track that same weekend. Mm-hmm. So I got a feel for what racing was like in Indiana when you pull it all together. It's just wonderful. Well, it's yeah, surreal. funny story about that. Um, uh, in Indianapolis one year, I was downtown. I got up early and I was walking around. And I went around a corner and ran right into uh, Van Gundy, who was coach of the Knicks at the time. And the Knicks were playing the Pacers. <laughs> That night, it was like the the night before the Indy 500, and uh, it was like the conference finals or something. And there was Van Gundy, and we just like walked into each other, you know. And I knew who he was. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a cool place to go. Uh, like I said, if if you're um, not, yeah, you know, I mean, if you're not really into motorsports, but you just want to go to a cool event, uh, I highly recommend it. Well, Florence Henderson did a. F- dynamite job with the that with the parade as well she i think yeah. she used to make that a regular occurrence there as yeah. well so, it's okay. so all right let's go into nascar a little bit you know nascar drivers you said you've had some over at that track and now jimmy johnson is going from nascar to a short the indy circuit so he'll have like 14 races half the workload but do you at one point or another can foresee jimmy johnson race competing on your track well it could, it could happen this year we haven't heard anything of his plans beyond um daytona uh the team he's driving for will be at sebring so we're hoping that uh, jimmy johnson will be part of that at sebring uh since he's not racing nascar anymore there's not a conflict right um so you know we certainly hope to see him you know we've had the nascar drivers compete there in the past um uh michael waltrip raced there a couple years ago and um a a few years back um bill elliott and ricky rudd uh were driving a a mustang uh in the 12 hours of sebring and uh they were leading until near the very end in their class 
and they ended up losing to um, a, another Mustang driven by Bruce Jenner, who, as you alluded to a little earlier, is no longer Bruce Jenner. But uh, so uh, we've had some interesting people driving this evening. I could only imagine. So we've one of my co-hosts that does fantasy football, Ken Ryan Schoolroot, I do happen to send him updates from IMSA because, you know, I got on the Daytona, I got on the NASCAR mailing list. IndyCar hasn't been cooperative in terms of sending me transcripts. And I really don't worry about it. I figure, well, hey, I got a great venue to promote if you don't want to do it. There's plenty of room for IMSA and NASCAR. And again, they're both great media distribution partners and I'm loving every second of it when I well, do it. And they're the same company. They're owned by the same company. So we're, right. we're, we're like a sister company to them. Oh, well, that's go. cool. So I was, so Ryan was uh, telling me because he's becoming more interested in reading these releases. Again, I'm trying to force feed him this stuff. But the one thing he pointed out to me but when, before we did a broadcast was I'm amazed at how many drivers come from, whether it's Formula One, whether it's NASCAR or IndyCar, end up winding up on the IMSA circuit, whether they don't have a sponsor or whether they don't have a ride, but they make a nice smooth transition come to IMSA. As, and as a result, they found a brand new home. Do you find that to be uh, pretty true or accurate? That a lot yeah, of I, think, I think so. I mean, uh, you probably remember in 2019 when uh, Fernando Alonso, who was an F1 driver, he, he won the uh, WEC race on Friday. Um, a lot of drivers from different disciplines end up in endurance racing or vice versa. And it's kind of interesting if you look at the history of Sebring, back in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of crossover. Um, uh, A.J. Foyt, Mara Andretti, Graham Hill, mm -hmm. all these drivers from Formula One or NASCAR or whatever would run endurance races. That was just, you know, part of their, their regular schedule. Well, as, as other forms of racing became um, more specialized and sponsor contracts usually prevented drivers from doing that because they would they would sign a contract to do a series and they, they couldn't go into another series where there's conflicting sponsors or whatever but now you're seeing it kind of go back again to how it was so as you mentioned um you're seeing a lot of f1 drivers nascar drivers uh even drag drivers uh going into endurance racing um it's 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 a good tool a uh, publicity thing for us you know, endurance racing, there's usually three or four drivers per car. So it's good to see a mixture of different disciplines represented in a car. Um, but uh, we certainly hope to see more of that. Um, you know, Jimmy Johnson is, is one of them. Um, we'd like to see some, uh, some other uh, drivers from other disciplines uh, come over and, and race with us eventually. Yeah, amazingly enough, when I think about Formula One, I think about IndyCar, I think about NASCAR, the three of the ones that I'm most familiar with before I got involved with them. So, which I think is the best thing I've ever done because I really love the sport and I'm passionate about it. I really, really am. And it's as am I, it's a great sport, sport. but I, I think what's great series. The, thing, the one thing that I really miss was I rock. Remember the international race yeah. of champions. <laughs> oh. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yep. That was a great series. Um, yeah. I, I think again, though, I think, that is a, a example of sponsor conflicts. I mean, it was, this, the IROC actually started with Porsches and then it ended up, I think, with uh, Camaros and Trans Ams. Um, and some drivers had exclusive deals to drive only Ford or Porsche or whatever, and they couldn't drive a, an IROC car. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's just, you know, one of those things that uh, sponsorships, unfortunately, uh, uh, or driving a driving force and uh, it's, it's just a reality of, of professional sports so mm -hmm. I think when you talk about drivers can you know overlapping a little two that come to mind are obvious or three actually you have Robbie Gordon you have Tony yeah, Stewart yeah. and wasn't the other one uh, the end John Dr John Andretti how they used to do the double dip between the Indianapolis 500 and then the Coca-Cola 600. And it's amazing how these drivers are able to do that. I mean, you go from one day to another. Well, to me, so I think that sets up a lot of what you're talking about, about the crossovers, but try to do that double header in one day. And that Memorial Day weekend, you're probably running on fumes. Maybe there is a pun intended with that. 
but those guys are unbelievable. You're right, and and John Andretti, um, he actually he did Indy cars and sports cars and NASCAR and also drag racing. He's one of the few wow. who also did drag racing. Now, he just passed away last year, and um, but he was a, a really really. Uh, I mean, he would he'd do he'd drive anything, and that is sort of the legacy of like Mario Andretti and AJ Foyt. They raced everything. Um, you know, Andretti and Foyt are the only drivers to have won the Indy 500, Daytona 500, and 12 Hours of Sebring. And uh, that's pretty amazing when you think about it. They're three totally different types of races. Right. But, but they right. won. Well, Robbie Gordon and Tony Stewart are junkies anyways. These guys here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, listen, if I were 20, 30 years younger uh, and I could do it, I would certainly do it. I wouldn't think twice about it. I run my own endurance race. Every travel time I travel all across the country, everybody thinks I'm crazy. And <laughs> I apologize for nothing if I am. It is what it is. But, uh, but you know, but I can appreciate an, a lifer at any sport, can whether it's auto racing, baseball, whatever. Once you're in this thing, there's no way you can really ever get out of it. You're hooked and you're a, a, an addict. So once you're hooked, you're hooked as Ron Renzi will find out come March, you know, it's one thing that he can retweet and share this stuff on social media, but wait till I drag him out there and you and I and him are out there. This guy's going to have a totally different attitude oh. than, he, than he is now. I'm a hundred percent looking forward to it. I'm a, I'm a big racing fan. I'm a huge um, um, Inspa fan. Definitely watched Sebring many, many times, but different one. Definitely want to experience it with you, Scott. I, I look forward to it, which well, I wanted to ask Ken, since you, are a fan of, of racing. Have you ever had a chance to watch Sebring as a fan? Because it must be totally different, you know, working as you do. Um, yeah, well, that's, yeah. that's a good question because one of the frustrating things about working there is that you, you don't really, you're so preoccupied with various things and, and babysitting people like Scott that you... <laughs> You miss, you really miss the, the atmosphere. Now, I started going to Sebring in 1975 when I was in oh. high school. And I, I attended Sebring every year from 75 to 85 as a spectator. And so I did get to enjoy that. I, I used to, uh, and there's a picture of me in, in my book, um, I camped under a wing of an old abandoned uh, Piedmont Airlines plane that was parked out by the side of the track. There used to be all these abandoned airplanes out there. And, you know, I got to experience, you know, all the crazy things and see all the crazy things. Um, so I did, I did get a taste of that, but it's been, you know, 30, 37 years. Occasionally I'll get to, you know, walk out to the hairpin or something for, for 10 minutes and, and watch, but, um, unfortunately, you know, as, as much as it's fun to be part of the, the whole Sebring thing, uh, when you're working there, you, you don't enjoy it uh, the way uh, fans do, certainly. Um, you know, I love the candor that you have here, Ken, about <laughs> babysitting guys like Scott, who didn't know anything about endurance racing. But I, I'd like to put it in terms like this, that you're educating me a little bit so that I don't have to rely on you as much as I have in the past. Because well, yeah. I'm, I'm, of course, joking. It's my job. I know you are. I know. <laughs> Do that. Um, but was yeah. I easier to handle this other time, though, than I was the first time? I mean, I was just outright didn't know what was going on there. Well, and, you know, in sports car racing, we always joke about this in the industry, is we do everything in our power to make it complicated and confusing. And, unfortunately, that that is the nature of sports car racing. You know, you when you have multi-class racing, you have the prototypes, you have LMP2, you have GT, GTLM, GTD. Uh, it's confusing. And a lot of people, you know, don't understand it. And we, as promoters, we have to understand that people, you know, are confused by that. Right. And it's not like NASCAR where you just got one, one driver per car and one winner and that's it. You know, we, it, endurance racing is, is a complex sport. Um, it's an acquired taste. You know, it's a niche. You know, we're not, uh, you know, as well known as other sports. We understand that. But, um, you know, as much as we joke about it, um, it is true. A lot of journalists who normally cover, you know, basketball, baseball, football, they come to Sebring and it's like, you know, what in the world is happening here? Oh, so it, it, is, uh, it is complicated. And we as uh, people in the industry have to understand 
that, uh, you know, y you have to help people understand it because it, it isn't easy to, to grasp initially. Um, even if you watch it on TV, I've noticed this, um, that uh, they'll start talking about different classes and who's leading and things without really explaining well, what, are, what those classes mean and why, why is this car in this class and this car isn't in that class. So, you know, it, it is, it is a, a more difficult sport to understand. Um, but that, all that aside, you know, one of the beauties of endurance racing is that most of the races are events. Mm -hmm. They're this big festival carnival with, with people and things going on. And, you, you know, you walk around to the different parts of the track. You don't sit in a grandstand and just watch, you know. And it, it's, it's like, you know, we, Sebring is known, they call it the Woodstock of auto racing. And that's, that's what it is. It's, it's a party, it's a race, you know, it's, uh, you got all these campsites and it, it's, it's, a, it's a really different experience. I make no bones about it. In 2019, I was as raw as you can get. But because I had you there, I had Kelsey Miller there. You two guys gave me the biggest, I hate to use the word crash course in a sport that uses the word a little bit. But unfortunately, the analogy is appropriate that I had to take a crash course and I had to learn it on the fly. You're right. I, I was used to a different kind of racing. But I'm telling you, once you understand the concept and, you know, by the my third time doing it, I'll probably become less dependent on you. But it doesn't mean well, I won't ask questions. But I just love doing it anyway, so I don't even care how we do it. We can joke around about all you want. But don't tell that to the average individual who's seen it for the first time that are kind of confused. In fact, let me give you an interesting example. For Super Bowl 33, when I covered the event for the first time, you know, I was in awe of the event. And I had Lee Remmel, the longtime PR guy for the Green Bay Packers, and Mike Murray. When they saw how I, my eyes got big and everything that was going on, I got lectured by both of those guys saying, you better calm it down, man. I know you're <laughs> excited to be here. And we're talking about the Super Bowl at that time, Ken. Yeah. And I got two separate lectures over this, and I admit I deserved them, so I, no, I make no bones about it. But once you relax and you assert yourself in that situation, you know what you're there. You're there because you're a professional. And when you're in an environment where you are professional, the fan stuff goes away. Now it's all business like you're talking about. Right. But it's a different animal. I think. But as you do it more often, like anything else, you certainly become a lot better at it for sure. And like I said, I'm very thankful that you had enough patience with me at the beginning to spend more time with me when I know you had a lot of other people that you had to help out, but you know, again, at least you know back then, and I always well, I make a real strong commitment to covering an event. I don't mess around, and I won't. Unfortunately, we're handicapped because we couldn't do videos this year because of COVID nineteen. But that doesn't mean the coverage landscape when we do it again, based on what we're, what happens then, will be a lot more interesting. You know, going sure. forward, absolutely. But, but you were so patient. I was so proud of you. It was unreal, and uh, and Kelsey, because I feel better about it now, though. And again. Don't think that all those releases that I've read from IMSA that I've educated myself on the fly to understand it a lot more. But the average individual, it takes a, it'll take them a while to grasp this concept. Because well, you're right. Well, well, well you, you know, you're, you're you're right about that, Scott. It takes a while to grasp. But I think the beauty of, of endurance racing and for IMSA with the four classes, once you learn it, you're hooked. It's one of those things where once you learn it, you go, this is really cool. And you understand why there's, you know, why GTD is different than GTLM and LMP2 is different than DPI. And you're like, look, it's a Porsche. It's a Mercedes. It's a Cadillac. And it, it's one of those things that kind of gets you into it. And I think that's why you, you become a fan, like you said, of, of the manufacturers and of the cars. And it becomes like a really thing that you can kind of think about it. It's a... you. It's a thinking form of auto racing, I might say. It's something you can really get into, and 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 you know, and the history behind the two, which kind of was wondering. I was wanted to ask Ken with you being so busy, what made you want to write a book? I mean, that that's a huge undertaking. Well, one of my uh, titles, official titles, is track historian, and um, you know, the over sixty eight years, you know, there's been a lot of a lot of races uh, at Sebring. There's never been a really a uh, a really good reference book as to what has happened through the history of the race. So I've been accumulating uh, both the statistical information and and photographs and and put it together into this 
volume, which is uh, I'll call it a Bible of Sebring history, it's it's more of a reference book as opposed to a book. Um, it's got a lot of stats, a lot of facts and figures. But if you have any question about what's happened at any year at Sebring, it's in the book. Um, and you know, it's it's useful to journalists like Scott and and other people because. Endurance racing is very much um, connected with its history. Um, people, people, especially the journalists who cover the race, but fans too, really like the history of the event, the evolution of the cars going way back. Um, it's just part of the atmosphere of, of endurance racing. And you, you said it very well. Um, you do get hooked on it. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a really fun sport. Um, it's, you know, it, we race in the day and the night, which is really different. And at Sebring, night is dark. I mean, we don't have lights there. It is really dark. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's just uh, the atmosphere is really unique. Um, when you see cars coming into the hairpin and braking, you know, from 180 to 20 miles an hour and the brakes are glowing and it, it's just a, it's, it's a real spectacle. It's, it's really a, a great, uh, a great event. And um most of the fans are really into the history of it. So that's sort of how the book evolved. Yeah. Why don't you, let me, I'm going to go back to the book in a moment because you're going to give information on how they can get it. But how did it feel with this last race, Ken, that you determined a champion at the end of the year versus being at the beginning? Because I know they, the Tono 500 likes to run their Super Bowl earlier in the year, which is where you kind of model yours at at the beginning of the year, uh, back to back with Rolex. But now all of a sudden you were placed in a unique situation where Kelsey Miller's track usually does it. And you were, we were joking around about it up in the box that, you know, I really like it in March. She can keep that race. So why don't you go into the mentality, though, what it was like to race – it, uh, during the latter part of the year where you're actually determining a champion? Well, that was certainly an added benefit is having all the championships determined at Sebring, you know, being the final race of the year. Um, and that, that added a lot of excitement to the event and, and a lot of importance to it. Uh, that being said, um, you know, our race is the third Saturday in March. Always has been, always will be. Um, circumstances uh, in this crazy year dictated otherwise, but um, we uh, we will always be in March. Um, and uh, it was great being the finale one year, but we'll give it back to Road Atlanta. Uh, they, they can have that. Uh, the other thing, you know, and, and, you know, we joke about it, but, you know, springtime in Florida, you know, we're, we coincided with spring break. Um, uh, people plan their vacations around Sebring. Uh, so when we moved the race in November, a lot of people just couldn't come. Uh, we weren't during spring break. And then we were up against, you know, football and all that, which, you know, we don't like to be. So it was, uh, it, it was just a, a different experience for us. Um, as it turned out, our TV package was fantastic. We were, the entire 12 hours was live on uh, NBC Sports Network, but three hours were on NBC Network, yeah. um, which is the first time the race has been on, you know, the actual NBC Network. So we had a lot of exposure. A lot of new people got to see Sebring. But again, um, we are, uh, uh, our event is the Harbinger of Spring, and we will always be the third Saturday in March. Well, you talk about spring break. What about spring training? Yeah. I mean, you know, think about it. Sebring, where you're at, you're around quite a few different venues, right smack in the middle of the state for the most part. I can't imagine that you're that far from the Tampa Bay area where there's a bunch of spring training. And well, now I, uh, Palm Beach County has a few of them too. So okay. when I first started at Sebring, um, you know, as a media director there, there was the only professional sports teams in Florida were the Miami Dolphins and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That was it. Yep. There was no heat or lightning or um, magic. Um, it, it, the sports scene has totally changed, as you know. Florida is, is I mean, the golf, you add in the golf tournaments and the tennis tournaments, NCAA uh, playoffs start right at Sebring weekend. Right. Uh, it, it's very competitive uh, market. So uh, th there's, you know, there's always competition and so forth. Uh, but 
again, it's in the business we call it date equity. We are always the same date and people work around that date. They know that date, all the travel, they, they plan everything around that date. So you can imagine how disruptive it was this year to, to tell people, hey, you know, we're gonna run in November this year. So well, it, it was a difficult situation. A lot of people had to make a lot of sacrifices. Um, but, you know, we, we did what we had to do. And if it happens again, you know, we'll, we'll adust. You know, well, I, it, I'm sorry, Ron. I can, no, I'm just saying, go ahead. I'm, I can only imagine, though, Ken, that the last race of the year, you're determining a champion. And I know you get a lot of fans anyways, but just say you had a full deck, a lot of fans last race of the year. The electricity involved for this race is one thing, but I would think it takes it up another 10 notches knowing full well if you, you, you're at full capacity championship weekend because I've covered races down at Miami Homestead as well. And I, I think that at Miami Homestead's another track that I uh, used to cover too. So can you imagine, though, a full track okay, in November championship on the line at Sebring in terms of electricity? Yeah, no, it, it was uh, a, a good experience. I'm not saying it, it's not something that, that we didn't like because it, it was a, added a significance to the event. Right. But again, uh, from a promoter standpoint, from a logistics standpoint, um, we, we always would be in March. That, that's just what we're about. And, and, and Ken, how was it running? Because you, you also ran the sprint race in the, in the summer, which is a very unique event for Sebring. How did that go? And is there any, any possibility that, that you guys can do a second race in the future, like a, after March? Or is that kind well, of a one-time thing? Yeah, the July race was certainly a one-time race because of all the, the rescheduling because of covid um, we announced uh, a few weeks ago that in November of next year, we will be having our first 24 hour race. Really? Um, yeah, really? it'll be the Creventex series, which is a series for GT3 cars. Um, and, uh, it's run in Europe and it's run at the track in Austin, Texas before. And we are going to have that event for the first time. Um, so that's going to be our, uh, our first 24 hour race, which I'm looking forward to. Um, Exciting. But, uh, again, the, the, the 12 hours is our brand. That's our race. It's that's the big show and it always will be. Um, I think in the distant future, you may see um, a NASCAR race, not the big cup series, but maybe uh, Xfinity or a truck race. Oh. At ring. Um, but, uh, sports cars will always be our, uh, our, uh, specialty. Let's put it that right. way. Yeah, you know, and, and uh, cause you, this, it's such a fantastic event. Do you see any, well, what are your predictions of any changes when the LMDH cars come out? Do you think it's, well, you know, what, what do you think about that? That whole situation? It, it's well, you know, the, uh, Porsche, uh, and Audi, have just announced they will have LMDH cars Excellent. and uh, Acura probably will, probably Mazda and Peugeot and Toyota have already announced hypercar, which is kind of similar, but it's a European version. So the quick answer is by 2023, when it really kicks in, you're going to see an incredible field of manufacturers and prototypes. Wow. Uh, I think the next two years, uh, it's sort of a lame duck here because, you know, everyone's building the new cars, um, but it'll still be some good events. But in 2023, it's going to be spectacular. Yeah, well, you just set up, Ron, my 24-hour event with Mr. Breslauer. I'll be out there. <laughs> uh, now I'm really getting the itch. and I don't, So get ready, folks. Ken and I have a lot of projects ahead of us, and I'd like to see how I handle the 24-hour, although at least – I won't be in the dark, literally, about understanding it. Now it's just a better of being able to know that I can stand it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so by, while I have an opportunity here on the broadcast, okay, the book that Ken Breslau was talking about is Show it. There you go. Uh, and I awesome. My hands are getting away, but here you go. Can you see it, Ken? Everybody? Yes, sir. Up? Absolutely. And there it is. So when you talk about old time racing, and no, I won't cover your. And Ken Breslauer is the author, and all that old, good old light C ring. This is that book that I'm holding up. It's a hard cover. So let me tell you, this is a beautiful book. I've had a chance to read it, look at it more. 
you know, and I think I'll, when I have a little bit more time off during the holidays and I'm not doing as many broadcasts, I'll be able to look at it a lot more anyway. But this is such a dynamite book. And when you realize how heavy it is, it's a great gift. But so let's look ahead, Ken, to 2021. You know, it's going to be back in the spring now, which is where you want it anyways. So what do we have to look forward to in 2021? Well, that, that's a good question. I wish I could answer it because there's so many things that are up in the air. Um, for example, the uh, um, World Endurance Championship, which is part of the Sebring weekend, is still tentative and will be until mid-January because of the COVID situation. Uh, most of the teams come from Europe and it's just too early to tell you know, what the situation will be. Uh, that being said, the race will run, uh, the 12 hour race will run Saturday, March 17th, uh, 17th, I'm sorry, Saturday, March 20th, gates will open on the 17th. And uh, the race will start at uh, approximately 10.30 a.m. We're expecting a, a great field of cars, um, uh, probably about 14 different manufacturers. Um, we'll have several supporting races uh, WEC, like I said, the World Nerds Championship is still tentative. Uh, we certainly hope they'll be there, but that is not definite yet. But um, as far as spectators, at this time, um, it looks like there may be some limits to capacity, like in November. Um, so we just urge fans to just keep an eye on our website or our social media. Um, we'll do whatever the county health officials and the CDC recommends. Um, but I would say it's a good chance um, there's going to be some limits to access in March uh, based on what's going on now, uh, meaning the paddock probably won't be open to spectators. Um, but again, things, you know, it's, it's a moving target. Things are changing every hour. So uh, the race will definitely run, maybe some limits. So we urge fans to just uh, stay tuned. So when you have your 24 hour endurance race, Ken, Will there be a lot of recognizable drivers that many of us can identify with? Because like anything this, else. When this you're... series is more of a uh, gentleman driver series where uh, the cars are usually required to have two uh, amateurs and one professional. So it, it's, it won't have the names that you'll see in March, okay. um, but the quality of cars is, is really good. Um, equal to the 12 hours in the GT classes, some really, really good machinery. Uh, there'll be a few names that you recognize, but basically this is more of a, a gentleman's series, um, but uh, it's, it's gonna be a great weekend because it won't be as crazy as the 12 hours, so fans will have really good access. And we're pretty sure by November, things will be pretty calmed down uh, with the COVID situation. So uh, it, it, I would highly recommend it to anybody who, uh, wants to experience a 24 hour race at Sebring like Scott, uh, this is your chance. So let's go ahead and paint a picture. We didn't have it this year in November, but for those that are watching this broadcast and hearing us for the first time, Ken, describe what 12 hours of Sebring is like at full capacity, the fan atmosphere and everything you've got there. Well, it, it's, uh, it's a, the track is a 3.74 mile, 17 turn track. Um, it's a former air base, so it's very flat, but there's not one inch of green space by the time all the motorhomes are set up, all the spectators have their camping areas set up. It is packed. Uh, like I said, it's a, kind of an eclectic crowd, uh, hardcore race fans, hardcore partiers. Um, it's just, a, a, you'll hear 10 different languages spoken, very international crowd. Um, it's, it's really, really an interesting experience. You, you can watch the race from so many different turns. Uh, we have view, viewing hills we've created and we have little grandstands, but most spectators walk around to the different turns and, and watch. Um, there's some elevated areas we've created artificially to, to watch, but it, it's a, it's a combination of festival party endurance race, um, it's, it's really, uh, it's sort of uh, the American version of Le Mans and it's, it's really a fun event. Um, under normal circumstances, fans have incredible access. You can walk into the paddock, you can walk right up to teams. 
Uh, we're not like Formula One or Le Mans where the, the fans are segregated from the teams. We let them mingle right in with all of the cars and drivers. And um, it's, it's really a, a open experience. Um, kids have a great time there. Uh, it's, it's really a fun event, very affordable event. We sell four day tickets, two day tickets, one day tickets. Uh, you can park for free outside the track and take shuttles in. There's all kinds of side activities. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a fun event. Fan friendly probably describes it. To Absolutely. Me. So when you talk about drivers and accessibility, a lot of times, Fans will wonder, can I get autographs from a lot of these drivers? Are you open to doing that a lot? I, I realize, let's take COVID out of the equation this time, okay? Because sometimes you have to be distant and you have certain passes to get you a gas clean alley and whatever. But what about autographs? How easy are they to get? Yeah, yeah under normal circumstances, uh, we have an official autograph session every year in the paddock. Every driver uh, participates. Um, they're required to participate and they love doing it. And the WC also does it. Um, the paddock is completely open, uh, and in normal circumstances, the pre-race grid is open, so fans can actually walk down pit lane, see all the cars, touch them, um, meet the drivers, the crews. Uh, the access is just amazing, but of course, we have to say that um, that access is probably going to be limited uh, again this year, um, hopefully for the last time. Um, but under normal circumstances, you will not find a track where spectators have more access than Seaburn. At other auto racing events, you have drivers selling merchandise. And obviously, you're able to identify what drivers selling merchandise. But this is such a unique animal, as Ron would say, because you're following manufacturers. Do you find that sometimes the merchandise that you buy is just as appealing, knowing you're buying it with a manufacturer's name on it? in as much as having a driver on there because who in their right mind wouldn't want to go out there and buy a jacket with Lamborghini, Mercedes, Benz, or Rolls Royce, Cadillac, yeah. whatnot. Absolutely. The, the, the vendors all sell manufacturer specific um, souvenirs and, and apparel and so forth. But another unique thing about Sabring is we have car corrals. There's a Corvette corral, there's a Porsche Corral, there's a Lexus Corral, there's a BMW Corral. And what that is, is an area that's designated just for owners of those cars. And uh, the Porsche and Corvette Corrals are a very organized uh, event where there's a little hospitality. Um, they, they have their own parking and uh, get together as the drivers come over there and meet the, the Corvette drivers will come over and meet the fans of Corvette. Uh, it's a really unique thing um, that very few tracks have. So uh, if, if you're a, a Corvette owner, a Porsche owner, a BMW owner, a, you, you can buy tickets just for your own area and be with your own group. Um, and that's, again, that's uh, the, the manufacturer loyalty that you see in endurance racing um, that uh, you don't see in any other sport. Ken, we're going to play the game name dropping, okay? And the reason why I want to play the name, game name dropping I want people out there that are watching and listening to this broadcast to realize that, you know, the type of people you bring in here, there are no, you know, there's some real big names out there. So why don't you give me a list of maybe 10, 15 names that come out, stand out in your mind about drivers that have raced, competed on this course. Well, of course, you know, from a historical standpoint, um, Mario Andretti, three-time winner of Sebring. A.J. Foyt, uh, the last ra uh, race he won in his career was the 12 Hours of Sebring in 1985. Uh, but we've had Sterling Moss win, Phil Hill, Dan Gurney, Jim Hall of Chaparral fame, uh, Hurley Haywood, Al Holbert. Um, he, he, the, the list is unbelievable. It's like a who's who of motorsports. And, and in terms of current drivers, uh, uh, Elio Castroneves, uh, Ryan Hunter Ray, um, uh, Scott Dixon. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, Alexander Rossi, another former Indy 500 winner. Um, it, it's you know, every top uh, IndyCar driver has competed at Sebring recently. And I'm saying we'll probably have probably seven or eight top IndyCar drivers in the 12 hours this year, or I'm sorry, next year. 
And uh, it's, uh, you know, the top drivers. If the WEC comes, um, we'll probably have probably 10 or 12 former Le Mans winners at Sebring. So it's, Sebring is the center of, of North American sports car racing. And um, if, if you're uh, uh, a sports car racing fan, um, you've got to experience Sebring at least once. You ever had Tony Stewart, Dale Earnhardt Sr. at that track? I'm sure I'm probably naming a few other ones. Yeah, actually, uh, Dale Earnhardt uh, Jr. and Sr. had a test at Sebring in the, uh, with Corvette because they were going to run uh, Corvette at the uh, Rolex at Sebring and at Le Mans. And of course, Senior was killed about a month later. Right. Um, so that never happened. But um, we've had, uh, um, yeah, I, I mentioned Michael Walter drove in the 12 hours a couple of years ago and he had a blast. He, he walked around the spectator area, spectator area and met the fans and, uh, joined some of the campsites and uh, had a few beers with the fans. And uh, it's, it's just the European drivers, especially who are not used to mingling with the fans. um, Love it. They love Sebring. Um, It's, it's just such a different atmosphere than the European circuits where again, you're very segregated from the the population. Um, At Sebring, you're in the middle of it and it's a, it's a lot of fun. What about Tony Stewart and Jeff Gordon? Uh, neither of them have raced at Sebring. Um, Jeff Gordon, I wouldn't be surprised to see him run at Sebring eventually. I don't. I think Tony Stewart is. I know he occasionally hops into a dirt car or something, but I think he's pretty much done. Um, but I, I'm going to venture to say Jeff Gordon may end up driving at Sebring. So for you Jeff Gordon fans that are interested in seeing Jeff Gordon, kind of like a little bit of a FYI here. And when we talk about the foreign language here, I always like to joke around with my friends and my listeners and wh- whoever, that when it comes to foreign languages, the only one I know is English, okay? Let me, <laughs> and let me give you guys a great, hilarious story, though, that, that I wasn't so hilarious when I had to deal with it, but it was that the University of South Florida, my alma mater, instituted a foreign language requirement. I knew about this about a year in advance. I knew that I never got past Spanish in high school because I ended up back in, in woodshop. Every time I got into a foreign language class, so where did I go? I went back to a shop class. There's no way I'm going to get this. So, you know, it's like, hey, you know, a kid goes ahead and they leave home. And, no, oh, I got to go back to mommy and daddy, which at that point, shop was mommy and daddy. You know, how much I work with my hands. Of course, back then, my mouth wasn't quite as established. Although, I got to tell you, I've been in broadcasting and media since 1979 but to make a long story short okay I decided to take a sprint car race through the curriculum and let me tell you I went ahead and got 25 credits in the last eight months to get the heck out of there this was no endurance race and I beat the foreign language requirement by August of 1986 because I didn't want to feel like I was dealing with welcome back Connor and I'd be a sweat hog you would be collecting my money and as a result, I never get the heck out of there. So, you know, I love endurance racing, but, you know, I, I don't know how I handle interacting with a lot of your European drivers, although I probably might not. I don't think I did too bad when I talked to a few of them. Well, I think uh, I don't know of a single European driver who doesn't speak fluent English. So you should be okay now. When I've been over to Le Mans uh, three or four times for the 24 hours of Le Mans, and there'll be a lot of people who don't speak English over there. Um, or don't want to speak English. Um, but uh, I would say most of the drivers that race in our series, the, the international drivers speak uh, pretty good English, so you should be okay. So who's that driver that thought I was a little long with it? Was it Curran, I think? You know, which Eric one? Curran? Huh? Eric Curran, who won Heck last damn. year? Oh, yeah. No, we had a good time. We actually connect on LinkedIn, but we had a good time. But, you know, I was one of his longer interviews at the end of a race. So I can imagine if I probably uh, taxed him a little bit too longer. But, you know, hey, hey, don't get me wrong. He was really a super nice guy. You know, again, I'm a rookie here. Didn't know how long an interview could be after 12 hours, by the way, of racing. But, you know, it is what it is. Oh, but, you know, again, your, your drivers are such candid, polite individuals that they understand what it takes to promote a sport. And they're willing to go out of their way to make sure that they, you know, make – 
uh, a good impression of themselves, but represent the sport in a very good way. So as we talk about the book Sebring, there's one big major question I have to ask you, Mr. Breslauer. Where can you get the book? The best place to get the book is just go to the Sebring website and click on merchandise and it'll come up. Uh, you can also go to the merchandise site directly, which is Sebring PX, like Peter X-Ray, SebringPX.com. And you'll see the book right there. And that's the easiest way to find it. It's not sold on Amazon. Uh, the only place you can get it would be at the Sebring Merchandise site or um, on Etsy.com. Very good. Ron, you have some qu other questions? Um, no, I just want everybody to buy the book because it looks really <laughs> exciting. And uh, I look forward to reading it and I uh, look forward to the brain. I just thank, thanks, Ken, for taking the time. And uh, you have a lot of knowledge in there. Well, I appreciate it. I, I always uh, like working with you guys. It's, you know, Scott's done a great job covering our event. You know, we joke with him, but uh, we always appreciate uh, the, the, the coverage. And, um, you know, and he, he's treated us well, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to having him back. So, you know what you ended up doing? You just talked yourself into another broadcast about this 24-hour race. So, uh -oh. now, now you're getting two for the price of one, Ken, just so you know. Got the 24-hour race, which... You know, I, I have every intention of getting to that one. I don't know whether my wife can handle it or she's going to find me if she's able to even get there. And, of course, I'm going back with Ron and my wife, you, you know, for the March one. So just give me more reason to strike, stoke a fuel inside of me and anything can happen. I mean, my goodness. I mean, come on, seriously. <laughs> I put I put auto racing in the major four. Sorry, NBA fans. Don't mean to burst your bubble, even if it's opening night, opening weekend. <laughs> But we're not in auto racing. We're not about drama. We're out about some heavy duty stuff, you know. And it's tough. When, when I had an auto racing broadcast in Arizona many years ago in Phoenix, when I worked out there and I was working with PIR a lot, you know, there was this age old question Are motorsports drivers considered athletes? So I've got to ask you what your take is on that, Ken. Would you consider that motorsports drivers are athletes? Well, I, especially endurance drivers. Mm -hmm. um, the very nature of the name of endurance racing. Uh, but I'll tell you something interesting. All the factory drivers, you know, Porsche and uh, Lamborghini and BMW, those drivers go through the most rigorous training you can imagine, physical training. And they all, uh, during the off season, which would be right now, they all have to go to essentially a boot camp and they have <clears throat> some serious workouts. And they're all just, I mean, super, super fit athletes. This isn't like the, the 60s where you have, you know, A.J. Foyt, who was a little big. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys are serious athletes. Um, almost all the factory teams require it now. Um, and not only that, they, they go through a very serious training from a PR standpoint, uh, dealing with the public, dealing with the media, um, they, as you just alluded to, they represent a manufacturer, they represent a sport. And uh, they are all taught, there's no dumb question. Um, it, it, it's, it's their job um, to, to you know, work with the public and work with the media. So you know, to answer your question, Absolutely. Now, all these kids, and they are kids, are great athletes. Um, it's a requirement. Um, plus, you know, the sim, sim racing, the simulated racing, um, when they're not training, physically training, they're on these simulators driving um, for hours. Um, and they can sit at home and drive at any track in the world on these simulators. And um, that's some serious stuff. It, it's not a video game. It's it's serious stuff. So the the level of fitness on the, the, these guys are really really good shape. Yeah, amazingly enough, you talk about sim driving long before auto racing got back going again because of COVID nineteen. You saw a lot of sim races going on during that period. Yep. Of time. So for a lot of you folks that don't know much about sim racing. You know, I'll tell you what, it, became, it took on an entirely different meaning here during COVID-19 until you get to the real thing, so to speak. So don't take it lightly. 
uh, these motorsport drivers here, there's more to them than meets the eye. I mean, what they have to do, you know, it's one thing to think that they do a pretty good job during a shorter event, but then take it many, many hours and holy moly, you got yourself a real unbelievable situation. So, you, you know, like I said, Ken, to me, anybody, it, it'll take them a while to appreciate it, but once you get this sport, you are definitely hooked. And and so now we here we are at Christmas Day, it's two days away. Are there any ticket specials or things on your book that people might want to take advantage of during the holiday time, or is it everything mainly straightforward pricing? No, I, no, I appreciate you asking that. Uh, we have a what's called an early bird special, uh, which runs until January 4th, uh, where we sell a four-day ticket uh, for the 12 hours of Sebring, uh, the mobile one 12 hours of Sebring, um, uh, at a discount, a pretty substantial discount. So if you go to SebringRaceway.com and order your ticket by uh, January 4th, you'll get a, a pretty nice discount. Um, and that's our big ticket special for the holidays. Um, so we urge people to take advantage of that. Uh, I don't want to do scare anyone but if we do have to limit ticket sales based on the COVID situation right uh, we will have to cut off sales at some point so i urge people to to get their tickets uh now or as soon as possible um i think there's a fairly good chance we're going to have to limit attendance well but this is a good opportunity for people to take advantage of it right now which is why i brought it up in the first place and for a lot of you folks Realize that I wrote a story on Sebring uh, bucket list that I sent to Ken, and that's out there in the South Florida Tribune.com. And I encourage you to read that article if you really want to get an idea of what we're talking about and spend a little more time doing it. Because I'll tell you what, I put a lot of thought, and mind, and experience into this thing. And as I, I'll find new things to talk about, but I think that there's no question that everybody in life has a bucket list item and it's all different. You know, I still have a lot of things on my bucket list and I will tell whether I get to them, but folks, okay. I don't care whether you're at any racetrack, whether you're up in the one in Michigan M1, which is obviously a good local track for gatherings or at Sebring or any of the other ones that I mentioned earlier, Sebring is a bucket list item. It's the most, you know, when you get it to me, it's a party festive thing type of track and the way you're treated there and the way people just circulate and you know as long as you do what you have to do nowadays to follow the protocols is one thing but you've got to get there and yeah. we're, in, we're an easy drive from uh tampa orlando miami west palm beach sarasota um so even if you come for the day the race day which is saturday the march 20th um we urge you to come experience at one time and like ron said uh, you'll get hooked uh, no doubt about it well you talked about my friend herb branham he was the biggest motor <laughs> chug on the planet you being a historian over at sebring he was a historian for the daytona international yeah. speedway for a lot of years and i ended up working with herb branham over at the tampa tribune we worked together over the east hillsborough section so i have a lot of friends that i've and connected with over the years. And I think the nicest part about being in the media is you meet more and more people. Sometimes your interests change, or though many years ago when the bad boys were playing, I love basketball, but then I shifted over to hockey. And then you find new challenges and things to take interest in. And I, but the one thing that's always been constant with me is I've always loved auto racing. You know, being from the Motor City, it's one thing. When you had the Michigan International Speedway, you had Belle Isle, and then you had a lot of neighboring tracks nearby in the Midwest. And then of course here in Florida where we have it pretty big and it's gotten bigger out West and East. It's just unreal, but what an incredible event that you have. So folks, if you get anything out of this broadcast tonight, because we, uh, I would encourage you to take a pencil and paper because you're not going to get it all in one listen or listen to it two or three times. You got plenty of time during the holiday to listen to this show a couple of times and make plans to get to Sebring. Are there any particular airports for those individuals if they want to fly into that are most recommended Ken? Well, Tampa and Orlando have the most flights. Um, as far as logistics, the closest airport actually is the Sarasota Bradenton Airport. It's only, you know, like an hour and 10 minutes from the track, but it's, it's a lot more difficult to get flights, uh, you know, in and out of there. M most of the journalists uh, and drivers fly into Orlando. That seems to be the, the airport of choice. A few of them actually go into West Palm Beach. Um, but, uh, if you are fortunate enough to have a private aircraft, then you can fly right into the track, uh, because of course we're right adjacent to Sebring Regional Airport, 
which doesn't have commercial traffic, but is a, a really nice airport. And uh, a lot of the race team owners, drivers do fly in, you know, right to the track. So fans, there you have it. Lots of ways to get to see ring. All you got to do is put it on your mind to do it. Whether you get there this year or hopefully in 2022, when Ken said there'll be a lot more activities going on. This is how you're going to get there. It's a great historical track. And let me just, before we end the broadcast, I do want to put the cover out there one more time, if I may. And this is Sebring. The author is Ken Breslauer, okay? And I encourage you to go out there and get the book. It, it's definitely a collector's item, and it's an item that every sports person that's connected with auto racing. Are, some of the drivers that you mentioned, are those names listed in this book as well? Absolutely. I, in fact, in the back of the book, there's an index, alphabetical index of every single driver who's competed at Sebring and the years they competed. And if you just skim through there, there's some amazing people that have driven in Sebring, not, not just drivers like Walter Cronkite drove in the 12 hours in 1959. Of course, Steve McQueen almost won the race in 1970. Uh, if you remember the Smothers brothers, uh, Dick Smothers uh, drove several years at Sebring and uh, won twice in his class. Uh, a, lot, a lot of interesting people, actors and politicians and journalists. Uh, it's, it's a lot of history there. Well, I can't wait to get somehow, some way. I can't wait to drive around this as if you got me cranked up even more. Anyhow, now oh, I got oh, the yeah. itch to get on that track, and I really need an itch. Now, come mm-hmm. on, there are there, where there's a will, there's a way, and I'm sure we'll figure out some sort of stuff to do it when the situation presents itself, where it's all safe for everybody involved. But you know what? As always, it's great to have Ken Breslauer here on the Sports Exchange. Well, my name is Scott Morgan, Roth, the Motor City Madmouth, coming from the Motor City, obviously, dealing with the guy that's involved with motor sports, and of course, the newest rookie, Ron Renzi, on the broadcast, though. This is his second rodeo with, you with the first time visual. But, you know, what an incredible broadcast we've had tonight, and I hope that everybody can go out there and take advantage of these specials to go to Sebring, or at least put it on their bucket list at some particular point. So, Ron, any closing thoughts? Uh, no, I just had a great time. Uh, thank you, Ken. I did have a, Ken, since you uh, talk about uh, endurance, how, how many times do you have to make the trip from West Palm to Seabury? <laughs> well, uh, starting next next uh, year, January, I'll probably be over there a lot, a couple times a week. Uh, but during the off season, uh, I, I can work out of the house. So that, that's a, it's a nice gig. <laughs> Yeah, for me, actually, it's two and a half hours from Deerfield Beach all the way up to Sebring. And uh, one of my moments where I need to go out there and take a, a vegging drive, and I, I'll tell you, I'm a very big power uh, meditating drive scan, as you probably know by now. Well, but Scott, always remember that uh, there is an Amtrak station in Sebring about two miles from the track. So if you ever want to take a train ride, you can take a train ride. How about that, folks? I don't want to drive wow. the train, but you know what? The odds are likely I'll probably drive it anyways because I'm so insane to begin with. That's a difference. So, meanwhile, <clears throat> meanwhile, folks, just so you know, Ron, why don't you let everybody know how they can get a hold of you and let Ken know what your day job is when he's not broadcasting with me and doing all kinds of stuff. Go ahead, Ron. My, my, my normal day job? Yeah, sure. My name is Ron Renzi. I'm an attorney in South Florida. My firm is Wahlberg and Renzi in Coral Springs, Florida, handling appellate practice and commercial litigation. You can reach us at 954-757-1212 or at info at Wahlberg, W-A-L-L-B-E-R-G dash Renzi, R-E-N-Z-Y dot com and on social media. Thank you, Scott. And it's been a pleasure. And of course, he's my assistant here, not only on the air, but he does a lot of other projects for me on social media that help the South Florida Tribune immensely. So we're glad well, to have him you. on our team. So, Ken, why don't you get the honors to let people know how they get old of you? Well, you can reach me at the uh, Sebring Raceway website, uh, kbreslauer at sebringraceway.com. And uh, on social media, Twitter, I do the Twitter account for the Raceway. So just uh, message me if you have any questions or comments, and uh, we'll get back to you. And I'm, and I'm very proud that, uh, Ken, that you follow us as well. It means a lot because I want to always continue to make sure our relationship is nothing short of top-notch, no matter how long-winded it gets, how crazy our <laughs> But friends accept each other for whatever the way they are anyways. It is what it is. So. But meanwhile, in terms of following us on social media, as we segue to that, okay, on Twitter, you can follow us at Tribune South. That's at Tribune South. We also have a Facebook page. You can hit us over there at South Florida Tribune. Believe it or not, Ken, we are on Instagram. I don't use it a lot, but for those individuals that want to follow us, they can follow us at South Florida Tribune on 
Twitter as well. Also, our YouTube channel for which this broadcast is obviously on right now. You can subscribe to the South Florida Tribune for nothing, and then you can see all the shows that we have. So anybody out there uh, that goes to YouTube, follow South Florida Tribune, subscribe it for free, and you get all this great entertainment and information that we're out here to try to provide. Our website's www.southfloridatribune.com. We have our media distribution partners. We have our columnists. And, of course, we have our broadcast on there. I am proud to say that Ken and IMSA, Sebring, are one of our major media distribution partners. So every time we get an update from IMSA, Sebring, it goes up not only on social media with Facebook, but especially Twitter as well. I want to make sure we get those updates to you out there as promptly as we can, whether they're at your track or in the sport in general. We make sure we get them up as quickly as we possibly can. Our email address is southfloridatribune at gmail.com. You can catch me on LinkedIn, Scott Morganroth. And, folks, if you want to hear the audio version of the broadcast, you can do so on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and whatever one of the ones you want to hear. they got 9 million of them. So you can go wherever you get your podcast. So you have the audio version, you have the video version, and you get a lot of information. And I do the best I can to associate myself with Class X. And, Ken, I say this from my heart to your ears, that, you know what, you are one of the finest PR people I've ever worked with, but we have a lot of good things that we're looking forward to doing. This is just the beginning, as we have over the last couple of years. And I'm very thankful to her, Branham, that I met such a Class act like you that has the patience to deal with somebody like me. My pleasure. I appreciate it, Scott. So, all right. I'm, uh, so, Ron, Renzi, why don't you go ahead and give the COVID message for everybody out there? Stay safe, social distance, wear your mask. And wash wash your hands. Wash your yes. Yeah, we got to <laughs> do all that business out there because it's the day that we have to do it. And I should say on behalf of Ken Breslauer, Ron Renzi, my name is Scott Morgan, Roth, the Motor City Madmouth. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Sports Games. More importantly, folks, happy holidays and Merry Christmas, okay? I know it's been a 20, uh, 2020 has been a very taxing year. I only have two words for 2020. Good riddance, okay? I have a feeling I may be in the majority with that one. So once again, folks, thanks for joining us on this edition of the Sports Exchange. And we will catch you the next time. And once again, we're going to have a couple more dates with Ken Breslauer as we have more events to uh, promote. Meanwhile, good night, everybody.